Very passable, that. Very passable bit of risotto. Nothing like a good glass of Chateau de Chasselet, Josiah. You are right there, Obadiah. Who would have thought a year ago we'd be sitting here enjoying a glass of Chateau de Chasselet, eh? Oh, it's been a strange old year, that's for sure. Never seen one stranger. A strange way to end our time here, that's for certain. Locked down for a whole year. Locked down. Nothing to eat but takeaways. Takeaways? God, I would have killed for a takeaway. Best we have is a dry piece of pasta we queued outside Sainsbury's for for three old days. You were lucky. Oh, we used to dream of a dry bit of pasta. We spent every night eating the scraps of biscuit and pedigree chum left over by the dog. But we were happy, though we were locked down. Because we were locked down, my old dad used to say, freedom doesn't buy you happiness, girl. <laughs> he was right. Uh, I was happy again. And I had nothing. Nothing? Didn't you say you had a dog? God, dog, I would have killed for a dog. Reason to go out in public without persecution from the police or judgment from the neighbours. Well, I say a dog. It, it was more like a rat that we found in a drain pipe in the garden that we dressed up like a dog. So we had an excuse to go out for a walk. A garden? I would have killed for a garden. We had a two metre by two metre. Um, yard behind the kitchen that all nine of us would have to cram into just to get a glimpse of the sun. You were lucky to have a yard, babes. We just had a window box on the top floor that all 26 of us would squeeze onto, petrified of falling to our deaths, just to spend some time outdoors. And half the window box was missing. No, I would have killed for a window box to sunbathing. Nearest we had to natural light was a crack in the attic. All 39 of us would go out there for five seconds a week and then be sent back to the cellar eating nothing but brown rice and tea. Hot tea? Yeah. You were lucky. All we had were mugs of cold tea with no milk or sugar or tea. Oh. And the teaching. Oh. 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 My parents, right, they used to get me up at the crack of dawn and threaten me if I even had a dream of interrupting them in their meetings. And then, at night time, at midnight, they'd chuck me back in my bedroom, lock me up, and give me a, a piece of cold mackerel and a, a slap across the face for using too much bandwidth. Shut up, you were lucky. My parents made me stay 12 months in a paper bag in a septic tank, and I'm claustrophobic over desire. I used to have to get up at three in the morning, clean the paper bag, eat a sour crust of bread, go work on Zoom 16 hours a day, week in, week out. And when I finished for the day, I'd dab with freshest of soup with his bell for making too much noise in the music lesson. Oh my God, girl. You were lucky. I used to have to work a 20 hour day on Google Classroom. No breaks, no co-curricular activities, literal or otherwise. Write 20,000 word essays each teacher, each lesson, and then mark the work myself. All before my mum would lock me in the car boot of a Range Rover for daring to interrupt her to ask for help with my physics coursework while she was doing her yoga session. Right, I had to get up at 10 at night Half an hour before going to bed, down a cup of sulfuric acid, work a 29 hour day on Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams, which the school didn't even use, all before doing the kids' homework. And then my mum would kill me and my dad would dance on my grave and sing hallelujah, all because I'd watched the Queen's Gambit the previous night. And you try telling the young people of today what it was really like living through lockdown, they wouldn't believe us. They wouldn't, babes. Sorry about that. We were asked to come up with a little sketch and that's what we came up with. Funny though, at least. Anyway, we now move on to the event proper and start with the traditional Latin address given by Lucy Hodgkinson and Will Jones. Fobis omnibus quibus haec nostra scholar curae est. Nos alumni salutem decimus plurimam. Hospes calibratus nostra, qui pine totam vitam in esexia agit. Discipulus factus est maleorum occidentalium cosociatorum. 
Dum tu de viginti anos and air socciatate stipendium eret. Pileo septem et quadriginta pro patria, quoque adeptus est. Nec minorum cursum gloriae, yam dudem secutus est. Non solum nuntius pilae per televisionem radionemque, sed etiam curator ludi angliae, et collegi pilae. Pro minerbus in ludo, equestri dignitate ornatus est. Hodie in primis salutamus, et gratias maximas, tibi agimus quod. Ceteris laboribus depositis. Hook venisti ad hunc festum diem nobiscum celebrandum, anno nostri scolae quadrincentesimo sexagesimo quinto. Floriat scola brentwoodiensis, vivat regina. Good evening, my lords, ladies, gentlemen and pupils, or maybe good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you are watching this. Welcome to our 464th speech day and prize giving. I think we had all hoped that 2021 would see a return to our usual arrangements for this event. But whilst this has not been possible, we are pleased to bring you our second, hopefully the last virtual speech day. I would like to begin by thanking all those who have been involved in putting it together. It is customary for me to thank my fellow governors on this occasion, and I have been particularly grateful to them over the past 12 months for the way they have continued to support the school from a distance. We have not missed a single meeting as a result of the pandemic, and it's fair to say we've all learned a lot about the wonders of modern technology. Governors have even observed lessons and done virtual learning walks with the help of Zoom and the willingness of our teachers and students to let them into their lessons. It was, however, a great pleasure to host our first in-person governors meeting for well over a year, a week or so ago, and to be back at the school. I first became associated with this school as an 11-year-old boy. I would particularly like to thank Bob McClintock, our Vice Chairman of Governors, and the Chairs of our various committees for their significant investment of time and their wisdom and expertise as we have continued to steer the school and support the leadership team. This year, we welcome Jason Fergus and Sarath Jeevan to the board. Jason is Director of Active Essex, one of the biggest active partnerships in the county and Lead Officer for Public Health Essex on Physical Activity. He has been involved with a number of significant sporting events in the region, including the London 2012 Olympic Mountain Bike Competition and the Tour de France routes through the country in 2014. Sharath is an old Brentwood and an entrepreneur who served on the steering group of the Education Commission set up by Gordon Brown and founded Steer Education, which has supported over 35,000 schools across Southeast Asia. Our governors are a talented and committed group of colleagues, and the school is fortunate to have their guidance and wisdom. I'm sure you will join me, at least virtually, in thanking them for their ongoing support. I would also like to publicly thank the headmaster, the bursar, and the school's leadership team. Since March 2020, they have had to move the whole operation of the school online, reopen the site safely in September, with all that that involved, move online again in January, and then reopen again in March this year. Each of these changes has involved a huge amount of planning and a lot of hard work in terms of delivery, but they have managed it all extraordinarily well. I don't think there are many, if any, schools in the country that have moved so seamlessly between the different phases, 
and I'm very grateful, as I'm sure are all our students, colleagues and parents, for their dedication, their skill and their leadership. And I must say on a personal note that I have much appreciated and valued my very close working relationship and friendship with Michael Bond, who has been simply extraordinary. None of our achievements would have been possible without the commitment, hard work and selflessness of all those who work at Brentwood. Our teachers have found even more creative ways of teaching both within and beyond the virtual classroom. And they have been supported throughout by our operational staff who have closed down and reopened the site twice whilst maintaining and improving it during the process. A truly extraordinary achievement. This time last year, we were looking forward to the opening of our new prep school buildings alongside the extensive refurbishment program being undertaken. I'm delighted to report that despite the additional challenges presented by the pandemic, that work has been completed and we now have a prep school with facilities that few can match. We have also continued to invest in the senior school site. We took advantage of the first lockdown to replace the whole of the main school roof. And Courage Hall has benefited from a major internal works programme that has seen the whole building painted, lighting improved and ceilings replaced. The cricket pavilion has been renovated and updated and is now being used both as a modern staff room and a place for us to host guests as sporting fixtures and other events return post COVID-19. This has allowed us to bring teaching back to schoolhouse with the creation of three classrooms that will be ready for the start of next term. A recording studio was installed last summer, enabling the further development of our outstanding performing arts provision, not to mention the staff Christmas charity single and their follow-up offering for Valentine's Day, which unearthed some hitherto unknown talent, although the headmaster has remained a bit tight-lipped on how big a part was played by the auto-tuning function. <laughs> We continue to plan for the future, to ensure our facilities and resources support our ambitious long-term vision and strategy for the school. That vision includes the continued expansion of our bursary programme. The pandemic may have temporarily slowed the work of the foundation, but it has not dimmed our ambition to provide funding for current and prospective students whose circumstances would otherwise mean that a Brentwood education would be out of the question. Our bursaries really do offer life-changing opportunities and we are extremely grateful to all those who support the work of the Foundation. For anyone interested in helping us with this mission, do please contact Jos Hollington in the Foundation office. The life of the school has started to return to some kind of normality in recent months. Sports fixtures in athletics and cricket have been a real highlight and we have enjoyed a programme of summer events that we missed so much last year. Whilst we will all be grateful to see coronavirus in the rearview mirror, the way our staff, students, parents and governors have come together over the past 15 months has demonstrated what a special place this really is. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you manage to have an enjoyable summer and I look forward to seeing you in person this time next year, if not before. Thank you. Earlier in the year, we put together a video highlighting the positives of the first year of living and learning through the pandemic. So much was achieved in that time, and we felt it appropriate to share that video again today. I'm proud of how our community has come together. I am proud that I didn't let lockdown affect my academic progress. I maintain my independence throughout lockdown. 
I am proud that I've taken part in the monologue competition. Lockdown didn't stop music and I'm proud that it didn't stop me either. I'm 17. I'm emotionally incapable of feeling loved. I'm proud of the whole IT department for the manner in which they moved the whole school online in a very short period of time. I was really proud that I used Google Classroom to hand in my assignments on time. I'm proud that I attended every lesson during lockdown. I'm really proud that I took the opportunity of Zoom to produce a concert for Care Homes. I'm really proud of the way that the whole school community responded to the challenge of doing the mass test. I'm really proud of myself this year for keeping my fitness up, especially with the Super Saturday workouts and how much the Dance Academy has been doing. I'm proud that I played football during lockdown. I'm glad to have been able to take part in co-curricular events, including the virtual field day that CCF ran. I'm proud of our first ever live stream Act of Remembrance service. I'm proud that I brought the school together to raise money for charity this year. enough to redecorate my room. I'm proud that I started a magazine for academic enrichment. I'm proud of 2PAL for their brilliant attitude and determination in lockdown. <laughs> help younger students with their well-being. I learned how to read and perform Shakespeare. I'm proud I could take part in loads of virtual music. I learned that if you dye your hair too many times in lockdown it falls out. I'm proud of my maths result over the end of year exams. I'm proud that I maintained and improved my hockey skills over lockdown. <laughs> I wrote and recorded the guitar parts for a brand new musical. I'm really proud of the fact that I was able to get involved with as much things as possible during lockdown. I learned to always make sure you're muted on Zoom. I'm proud that I learned to organise myself. I'm proud that I had the opportunity to start a new podcast series with my friend. I'm proud that I've been able to find time to develop and perfect my editing skills. I am proud that I've been able to take part in an award-winning Shakespeare Festival drama. I'm proud I won the first ever Virtual House Music. I'm proud of Mr Rees moving from his OHP to Zoom. I'm proud of our musicians. I'm proud of singing with my choir during lockdown. I'm really happy because I've got back into playing loads of chess. I'm so proud of my son and my daughter. I'm really proud of how the whole community has come together. And on behalf of the old Brentwoods behind me, we'd just like to say a huge thank you to all of you. I'm proud that I walked 1,800 miles during lockdown. I am extremely proud of my fourth form drama club. The thing that I'm most proud of is, uh, unsurprisingly, writing and producing a full musical. I'm really proud of the Brentwood community. Although we've been made to stay apart, we've remained together and become stronger for it. As Sir Michael has said, we hoped we would be able to be together today for our usual speech day event, but the uncertainty around whether large gatherings would be permitted has meant that we're back online for the second year running, hopefully for the last time.
I'm delighted, however, that we are able to bring you a virtual event we think you will enjoy. We've certainly had plenty of practice at putting together online concerts and celebrations over the past 15 months, and I'm very grateful to all those who have contributed to this offering, both in front of and behind the camera. The theme of this year's speech day is the journey, and it's one I'm sure we can all relate to when we look back at the academic year that's coming to an end. Every one of us has been on our own journey through the pandemic, but we've also had so many shared experiences that have, I think, taught us as much about ourselves as it has about our school. Twelve months ago, I talked about how proud I was at how the whole Brentwood School community had come together. Little did I know that 2020-21 would see two further lockdowns and reopenings, though I'd learned enough by this time last year to know that we would rise to the challenge. And so it has been. I would like to start by thanking my colleagues who have switched seamlessly between in-person and online teaching. They've supported those who have been adversely affected by the virus and the lockdowns. They've worked tirelessly to interpret and implement the complex rules governing the award of GCSE, IB, A-level and BTEC grades. They've closed the site down and stood it back up again, including the processing of almost 5,000 COVID tests in less than a fortnight back in March and they've carried out maintenance and improvement works to ensure that our facilities continue to be the best they can possibly be for our students. I said last year that I didn't think there were many schools in the country that had risen to the challenge posed by the pandemic better than Brentwood, and I repeat that claim with confidence today. None of that would have been possible without the dedication and selflessness of those who give the best of themselves to make this school such a special place. Thank you. We have been supported in our efforts by our governing body who work behind the scenes free of any charge to guide and steer the school. As you heard earlier from Sir Michael Snyder, our Chair of Governors, they have not missed a single meeting and their support has been steadfast throughout. I would like to place on record my thanks to them all, and in particular to Sir Michael, whose counsel I have sought many times and whose support has been unwavering. He and they are proud to be part of our community, and we are all the better for that. I would also like to thank the old Brentwoods and the friends of Brentwood School who have navigated their way through the pandemic and found ways to continue the support they offer us. We are all looking forward to being able to get back to in-person events and to reconnect with each other on the other side of COVID-19. To those parents who are watching, thank you as well. You have had two periods of homeschooling to oversee, and whilst I hope we've made it as easy as possible for you by providing a full timetable of lessons and activities, I know how much support and encouragement you have given your sons and daughters as they have moved between the lockdowns. There have, of course, been disagreements about how the country should tackle coronavirus, and our community reflects the diverse opinions about what should or shouldn't have been done. But I'm grateful for the way you have supported the school as we have sought to do what we think is best to ensure the continuity of education for our students. And finally, I'd like to thank our students. From one-way systems, to year group bubbles, to face coverings, to COVID tests, they have taken everything the pandemic has thrown at them in their stride, and they've just kept going. Academically, the pandemic hasn't stopped our students making progress with their learning. To date, I have made 102 Headmasters Academic Endeavour Awards this year. Five of our students will be heading to Oxford or Cambridge next year, and nine have been offered places at international universities, including fully funded scholarships at Yale and Harvard. Our first cohort of BTEC students have also completed their course. Three of the four students have accepted places at Durham, Bath and Exeter universities, and another is about to start work as a junior broker. 
One of the great strengths of Brentwood is the fact that, unlike most independent schools in the country, we now have three very successful sixth form pathways, the IB Diploma, A-Levels and BTEC, all of which offer a route to success for our students. Attendance at our Saturday sports programme during the Michaelmas term, when we were unable to play against other schools, remained high and our students made the best of our internal fixture programme. During lockdown, we had a regular cohort of students and parents who turned up for our Super Saturday workouts and we've all thoroughly enjoyed the return to competitive sport in recent weeks. Our music, drama and dance departments have continued to keep everyone's spirits up. Our socially distanced concerts in the Michaelmas term made us all realise how much we'd missed live music. Virtual Music Land Part 2 was delivered with as much gusto as its, as its predecessor and we even premiered our own original performance, Lockdown the Musical, featuring some of our many talented actors and musicians. Clubs and societies, including our CCF and Voluntary Service Activity and our Duke of Edinburgh Award Programme, have continued to help students develop new skills and an understanding of their world. And our charity work has continued with ever more creative ways of raising awareness and funds to support our worthy causes through our house system. The future remains bright for our school. Despite the operational challenges posed by coronavirus, we have continued our work behind the scenes on the long-term strategy we wrote in 2019, and we look forward to saying more about that next year. One early outcome of that work is the formal partnership we've now established with the Guildhall School of Music and Drama that will see increasingly close links develop between us. We will be pursuing our ambitious plans for partnership with other organisations as the pandemic recedes. As I mentioned when I began my address, the theme of today's event is the journey. And I'd like to end by borrowing the words of John Roberts, one of the nine US Supreme Court justices, who was the guest of honour at his son's graduation from middle school in 2017. His speech was not the usual type of fare you might expect, but his message was a very important one. Here is an excerpt from his speech. From time to time, in the years to come, I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you will be lonely from time to time, so that you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck, again, from time to time, so that you will be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. And when you lose, as you will from time to time, I hope every now and then your opponent will gloat over your failure. It is a way for you to understand the importance of sportsmanship. I hope you'll be ignored so you know the importance of listening to others. And I hope you will have just enough pain to learn compassion. It's an interesting approach to wish people bad luck and misfortune at a speech day celebration event. But John Roberts ended that part of his address with the following words. Whether I wish these things or not, they are going to happen, and whether you benefit from them or not will depend on your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. What he meant, of course, was that none of us can control everything that happens to us in life, but we can control the way we respond and the mindset we adopt when things don't go our way. We can either be diminished by these experiences or we can choose to see them as opportunities for us to improve. And note that John Roberts wasn't just talking about failing a test or not being selected for a team. He was also talking about other people being unkind or getting something they don't deserve. How we respond to those things is also important. We can either choose to lower our own moral standards or we can maintain or even raise them. 
And whatever we choose, there will be consequences to those decisions. All of that is part of the journey of life, which is rarely straightforward. In fact, it's often less like a Roman road and more like Spaghetti Junction at times. But by making more good choices than poor ones, when things go against us, we will improve as individuals. And if as a community we commit to this principle, we will all reap the benefits. As John Roberts said, this will all depend on whether we see the message in our misfortunes. I wish you all a safe, healthy and happy summer break. For those moving on, good luck and farewell as you move forward with the next stage of your journey. For those returning in September, I look forward to seeing you as we continue with ours here at Brentwood School. Thank you. In what has been an extraordinary year, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate the successes of all our students across the school. Congratulations to everyone for all your hard work, for your support of each other, for your own achievements and those of your year groups, and for the resilience, courage and kindness you've shown this year. Moving to the formal prizes, in the first to fifth year, form achievement and endeavour prizes are awarded to individuals in each form group. Subject prizes are awarded for outstanding achievement in a range of disciplines, including music, drama and the performing arts, science, technology, English, modern and classical languages, and art. Additionally, for each year group in the fifth year, there is a prize for all-round contribution to the school.
We will now hear from our guest speaker, Sir Trevor Brooking, and there's a lot to learn from listening to his journey, which has not always been straightforward. When we're in the moment, we can't always tell if a challenge or a setback is going to be the very catalyst that leads to our success. Now there's a bit of space for Lampard. Chip it again towards Brooking. And it's there! Brooking has done it! Last Rice and Tor, but there's a lovely cross coming in there. David Cross, Pearson, Brooking with the header! West Ham in the lead! Taylor, Brooking, beautiful timing! Yeah, hi, I've lived in uh, Brentwood now for over 40 years. Been lucky enough for my two children and grandchildren to go to uh, Brentwood School, where they've been really happy and I think uh, I've learned a lot. More than anything, my own school in was a bit different, I've got to say. Uh, I lived in Barking uh, up until 11, and then I went to Ilford County High School for boys. And uh, up until about 15, things were ticking along okay, and then I had to start making decisions. Um, the Football Scouts came along and a lot of clubs invited us to actually join the club for three years as an apprentice and the school leaving age of course then was that year younger so I would have left without taking any GCSEs and so forth. Mum and Dad weren't too pleased with that, they wanted me at being at a grammar school to stay on, take my GCEs and perhaps sign for a club for two years. And that's what I did. Uh, when the clubs came round, it was sort of May, June, 1964. And uh, I happened to be in the England schoolboy squad. There were 16 of us in there. And um, yeah, I played one game against Germany, but the other three or four, I was on the bench. And we were finishing up with a trip to Northern Ireland. All oh, seemed to be going okay until a couple of days before and I got a call. And um, apparently they could only take 15 of the 16 players, and I was the one to be left out. I was pretty upset and mortified. I remember mum and dad setting me down and saying, all right, take it easy. But my dad was the one who said, look, you've got to use this as an incentive. Try and prove them wrong in the next few years, work hard, and see what happens on the football inside. Well, I was lucky. Uh, I played for the England under-18s for a number of times, the under-23s, which was the equivalent of today's under-21s, and then went on to play nearly 50 times for the senior side. So more than anything, I did use that as a way to try and prove that particular selector wrong, uh, and that bet did benefit me. So as I say, that was 64. I decided to join the club a year later. And in 65, when I did, actually, I spoke to the club. And my mum and dad said, can we get a day release East Ham College, which I did. So I went there one day a week for the next couple of years. And then when I signed my professional contract in the summer of 1967, I'd actually accumulated another four O levels uh, with the eight that I had when I left school. And then also had a couple of A levels. So I was known as a bit of a bookworm in the footballing industry, but more than anything, my mum and dad were happy because I had something to fall back on if things didn't work out from a footballing point of view. So going back to 1964, um, you know, West Ham were lucky enough to get into the cup final. They beat Preston 3-2. More importantly, uh, if you're a West Ham fan, we actually beat Manchester United in the semi-final and playing there with George Best, Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law. So that was a bit special. Uh, 65 then, having won the cup final, we got in the Cup Winners' Cup. We got to the final there. We played Munich 1860 at Wembley and won that. That was the summer that I joined the club. And then, of course, you know, in 1966. If you're a West Ham fan, we all say West Ham won the World Cup. And it's slightly wrong because it was England who won the World Cup, the only time we had won the World Cup. But more importantly was we had three West Ham players in that starting 11, which was pretty amazing. We had Bobby Moore, who's a captain, lifted the trophy. The hat-trick man in the final when we beat Germany 4-2 was Jeff Hurst, the only time anyone scored a hat-trick in a World Cup final. And the other goal was scored by Martin Peters, the other hammer. So you imagine a month later when we all went back pre-season, the number of media people, and broadcasting people was massive. As a young player, to watch all this happen and see these three World Cup lads was special. And certainly for the next year, training and playing with them, I learned a lot and building up to 67, uh, I signed my professional contract. Then uh, two or three months later, I was lucky enough 
be offered my first team opportunity. Uh, Ron Greenwood approached me and he said, always liked us to play away from home in our first team debut rather than put us under pressure in front of the home crowd. So we went up to Burnley, who were a good side in those days. We had a good performance, we drew 3-3. Even more special, though, was our goal scorers. And yes, you've guessed it, our goal scorers were Martin Peters, Jeff Hurst, and Bobby Moore. Amazing, because Bobby didn't score many goals. So for me, in my debut, to have the three World Cup lads score was special and something, you know, I remember for the rest of my life. I then had 17 years ahead of me at the club. Um, certainly 75, we won the FA Cup. Uh, we beat Fulham 2-0. Who was playing in the opposition? Yeah, Bobby Moore. But three years later, a bit of a low because we ended up getting relegated. Um, We went down, we were hoping to bounce back within one year, but six games to go, we were in a little bit of contention. I injured myself, missed out the last six games, and we didn't go up. I felt uh, a little bit awkward. Should I leave at this particular time? Should I go and get transferred? No, I'm gonna give it a go. John Lyle said he was hoping to get two or three players in that will strengthen the team. We did get them in, the likes of Phil Parks, goalkeeper, Alvin Martin at central defence, Alan Devonshire in midfield, but they came later in the season and we didn't quite able to get into a league position that would get us promoted. But what we did do was an FA Cup. Um, We had a great run in the quarterfinals. We beat Aston Villa, a strong team. In the semifinals, we beat Everton, uh, beat them after two games. And then we waited in the final because... Arsenal and Liverpool played each other unbelievably four times before Arsenal came through. Everyone assumed whoever won that semi would win the final, but cup games are different. We were pretty confident by the time we played the final and we ended up winning 1-0. Even more of a surprise was the fact that I scored the only goal and even more of a surprise above that was it happened to be with my head. I wasn't the greatest head of the ball, but managed to score uh, my one goal of the season with my head in a cup final. So that was great. The confidence we got from that the following season, we we ended up running away with a second division championship. It was the last season, actually, of two points for a win. And in the last game, when we beat Sheffield Wednesday, we accumulated a a record points total for any side going up from that division. We then ended up three years, you know, in the top flight and sort of summer of 84. uh, I was coming up to my 36th birthday. The legs were beginning to feel a little bit tired. And uh, I thought to myself, what am I gonna do in the future? That's when I've got to say, what I did educationally, staying on, you know, doing the GCSEs and then going to college put me in good stead because I was offered a 18 year spell at Match of the Day, BBC Radio for 18 years talking about the game. And then two years after I packed up playing in 86, um, Eastern Region, the Sports Council came to us to see if I would become chairman in the Eastern Region, which was Essex and five other counties. I said yes, so I started doing that for a few years, got on the National Council, and then actually became well, as chairman, and then chairman of the Sports Council. And the time was great because this was 1998, and that's when the National Lottery came. I say it was great because up until then, whole of sport in this country had 60 million to spend, but suddenly we had over 300 million extra. So we sat down and thought, how are we gonna spend this money? So we decided, look, Let's identify the best specialists in the different sports. Let's fund them for the next two years. And then when we go to Sydney, Australia, hopefully they'll produce some medals that we've never seen before. And that's what happened. We went out there. I was lucky enough to spend the time there and we won more gold, silvers uh, and bronze than ever before. That really has been a cycle now for every four years where if you look at us, we've added additional sports as well, where we are particularly strong in, you know, competing at that level. I left after about two years, 2002, and then for a year tried one or two things and then suddenly who came knocking on the door was the Football Association. They'd watched us during that period of time. I had been quite critical on the TV and radio about the style of football that English clubs were playing. They were whacking it long ball, looking for throw-ins, long throws, free kicks, and bypassing the midfield that I used to play in myself. So uh, as they came to me, the Football Association, they said, can you get us playing a bit better technically, playing out through the three thirds, the back third, the middle third, and the attacking third, and really changing the coaching courses that we operated. We did that for a few years, we were quite successful. The one frustration was, did we have a hub site that we could work from? Uh, we'd been rejected twice, but then in 2010, uh, amazingly, we got it over the line and they agreed to actually build the National Football Centre and uh, up at Staffordshire and that's St George's Park. The opening of that in 2012 really was the turning point, I think, for football in this country. I spent a couple of two, two or three years 
appointing the right people, I thought. And a key one, of course, was probably Gareth Southgate, who lived up in Yorkshire and was quite happy then to operate out of St George's Park. And he then became the under-21 manager downwards, so 20s, 19s, 18, 17, 16, and got them playing the way that we wanted to play. I then left in about 2015. I've watched on the sidelines. Probably 2017 was the one year which showed the progress we were making. In 2017, uh, the 17s with the likes of Foden and Sancho, they, they won the World Cup, beat Spain 5-2. The 18s won the Toulon tournament. The under-19s won the European Championships. The under-20s won the, un, uh, the World Cup. And then <laughs> the under-21s actually got knocked out in the semi-final uh, to Germany. But we had five years of talented youngsters coming through, which were obviously going to provide uh, the England full manager with a good supply of players. Gareth, of course, took over that. And as we sit here now, we've got a big tournament coming up where hopefully, you know, we do well. But it was always a 10-year plan and 2022 was the time that I was waiting. Have we got the players coming through? And the answer is yes. So from your point of view, you know, as you receive your rewards today, I'd like to congratulate you. You've worked hard. But you're going to be leaving school soon. And what you probably learned, hopefully, from listening to me is... Life is a roller coaster. When you leave here, you're going to have your highs, your lows, frustrations, disappointments. But the important thing when you get the disappointments is probably to try and make yourself bounce back that much quicker. Be strong. Accept those disappointments. Go get down because then it'll be harder for you to come out of them. So, as I say, well done to the recipients today. But more importantly, in the future, going ahead, you know, I wish you all the best and work hard. And now, the sixth form prizes. Prizes in the sixth form recognise exceptional commitment and dedication in the pursuit of excellence, whether academic or in our ever-ambitious co-curricular programme. The attributes students have acquired in our sixth form mean they are prepared for future challenges and successes.
Hello everyone, me again. Thank you for watching our speech day today. It's a Brentwood tradition for this event to take place and I'm pleased to be able to take part, albeit virtual. We hoped last year that we wouldn't be in this position again and that we could be together in person. Yet this is just a testament to our school community, being able to pull together again throughout multiple lockdowns. So thank you to all those who have made this possible, especially our guest speaker, Sir Trevor Brooking, the Chairman of Governors, Sir Michael, and our Headmaster, Mr Bond. This year has been one we certainly won't forget. It has been tremendously difficult for so many, and I would like to encourage those to acknowledge their mental strength and resilience. Students across the country have been able to adapt to online learning, which at Brentwood, the transition from in-person to online teaching was made incredibly smooth by our teachers and staff, but worked so successfully because of our students' dedication. My last two years of school throughout COVID taught me that school is so much more than what is learnt inside the classroom. Brentwood is not just academic grades. It's every performance and concert put on by the performing arts department, every sports fixture played and CCF or DV trip that we go on to just name a few aspects of our school life. COVID taught us that we can learn quite easily at home. But what we missed was our community and the people and friends that we grew up with here. Some of our upper sixth students have been together since they were three years old, and this September will be the first time they head somewhere new and unfamiliar. What we will miss won't be the structure of school, but the safe and secure feeling we associate with Brentwood, and it will forever hold a special place in our hearts because of all of the happy memories we hold here. This hasn't been the last year of school that the upper sixth expected, and there's been so much uncertainty concerning ours and the fifth year's exams. But hopefully this year has encouraged us all to take in every moment of our school lives because it truly goes by in the blink of an eye. That brings us to the end of a very different but very special speech day and prize giving ceremony. Thank you again for watching our speech day and I hope you all have a lovely and safe summer.